good evening. Thank you for coming out here. And so Studio X. Uh, it's a great pleasure tonight to welcome Hannah uh, Wright. Uh, you're the fourth of our speakers in this Istanbul 95 uh, talks, uh, discussing together with us uh, what is the uh, future of childhood in cities. Uh, Hannah is our urban planner and knowledge integrator. I would like to know what a knowledge integrator is later. Um, she has interna international experience uh, of seven years uh, working, among other things, at Arab, preparing the Cities Alive guides. Um, as well as uh, working as an advisor to Bernard Fernand Foundation uh, efforts. So, welcome, Hannah, and looking forward to your talk. Um, okay, wow, microphone. Um, yeah, thank you very much for having me, and thank you for showing me such a, a warm welcome over the past few days. We've been doing some really nice uh, lectures, workshops, um, and it's been great to hear your ideas and to do some knowledge integration over the past couple of days. Um, uh, but tonight I've been asked to speak to you about uh, a project that I've been working on in India and show, share some of that experience, which I think is quite timely. So just two days ago, I learned that it was Children's Day in Turkey. Um, and at that point, um, the president's press office said that uh, their greatest desire is to prepare a much brighter f uh, tomorrow for our children and youth. Um, and he was quoted saying that as a nation... Uh, Turkey sees the children as the most precious asset in the world. So I'd like to use this example to really test that theory and to set a challenge, perhaps, for how you can really create cities for children. So I'll be talking about um, a project that we did in India uh, for the 100 Smart Cities mission and how we were trying to take children from a situation where they were only surviving to a situation where they have the potential to thrive. Um, I've been starting all of my presentations with this quote, which has really inspired me this year. Uh, it's a quote from a, a psychologist called James Hillman uh, that says, how we imagine our cities, how we envision their goals and values and enhance their beauty defines the self of each person in that, in that city. Um, and that quote for me is very important because it acknowledges the interrelationship between health and well-being and the built environment. Our surroundings really influence the way we experience the city day to day. And all of that influences the way that we develop as people um, and as citizens um, to be able to deal with challenges in the future. Um, that self, importantly, is uh, defined very rapidly in the first three to five years of our lives. Um, so the Bernard Van Leer Foundation have a project uh, called Urban 95, which focuses particularly on uh, of children under five years old. And the reason being that in the first 1,000 days of your life, um, you will develop most rapidly. Um, here you can see a chart that shows uh, the ability to change your behaviours declines as we go through our life and the amount of effort that it requires for us to change our behaviours increases as we go through life. So there's a real window of opportunity to provide a good start in life in those first three years. Importantly, our experience of the first three to five years uh, changes very rapidly as well. So the way that we move around and learn and interact uh, with our environment from sort of being on our bellies, crawling, walking, eventually gaining some independence uh, changes very quickly. And also uh, the experience for the parent or caregiver changes very rapidly. So from pregnancy um, to uh, carrying the baby uh, to walking, hand-holding and eventually um, allowing some more freedom from the child. So that interaction is also very importantly uh, changing. If you were to compare uh, three to five years as a time scale to sort of underline this importance, it's about a similar sort of time scale as a construction project in a city. So the time it takes to, to build perhaps, uh, I don't know how long the project is, but the, the Galata Port project could be this important window in a childhood um, and important influence on the life in the future. So if you imagine all of the different experiences of the city in terms of construction, noise, vibration, air quality, dust, uh, those different challenges, um, how does that impact the first three to five years? Trying to underline here the importance of development in, in the child's experience particularly as the way that you experience those construction projects um, really varies at the, at the street level. Um, and it can mean a, um, a sort of reduced uh, experience for, or a more difficult experience for the child or the caregiver. 
Uh, the other example I was going to give is that five years is a political term, so the choices that decision makers are making in those five years can have a huge impact on, on childhood in the first five years. Um, this is an image from a, a story I've been learning about in the last couple of days, where after losing a, um, uh, the local election, uh, somebody who had put in a playground two weeks before the elections then took it down um, because they weren't uh, re-elected uh, after that point. So the, the decisions and the choices, yeah, <laughs> the decisions and the choices that are being made by politicians really affects that experience as well, uh, and most likely the um, the decisions that are made in those five years do have repercussions for the next five years and so on and so forth. Um, I'm going to be um, uh, talking about some of the values uh, that I was involved in uh, developing as part of this Cities Alive uh, Arab initiative. I think there are copies uh, available. So this was a project uh, that I was leading with Sam Williams, Felicita Sudona and Tim Gill while I was working at Arab. Um, the idea behind this initiative, uh, Designing for Urban Childhoods, was to put child-friendly urban planning on the agenda for cities, for developers, and for built environment professionals. Um, and what we were trying to underline here is that actually if you can design a city for children, it should work better for everybody. Um, I'm going to run you through just some of those principles, because I think uh, child-friendly urban planning is new to some people here. Um, so as I said, it's a, a vital part of creating um, inclusive cities that work better for everybody. Um, and the presence of children in the public realm is a good indication of quality of life. Um, so if you have a, a, a street or a, a space where children are out and playing and enjoying themselves, also is a good indication that that place is sort of safer, more inclusive, uh, working better for a greater range of, of needs. Um, we try to encourage uh, multifunctional and playable uh, public space. So not thinking of spaces for children in the city only as play spaces, as particular parts of the city, but in thinking of the entirety of the public realm um, as a, a potential to experience everyday freedoms. By everyday freedoms, I mean self-directed play as a fundamental human expression and a very important part of child development, and also uh, the ability to move around um, with your uh, parent or your caregiver. Um, also uh, to be able to spend time with families between different age groups um, and not only have to go to a space um, uh, that's exclusively for one group. Uh, we talked about the interventions at the neighbourhood scale as a really good opportunity um, to, to offer safe and enjoyable journeys every day. Um, so this is the importance of uh, routes and streets as well as destinations. Um, your first steps out of your house, out of your door, are what influence the behaviours in the rest of the city. If you can have that as a good start between the public and private realm, then you, can, um, you have a better opportunity to enhance those healthy behaviours as you continue your journey uh, through the city. And the neighbourhood scale is a, a scale that identifies well for children um, and for the community in terms of their kind of range of vision and what they relate to. Um, but also it works with the roaming range of, of kids um, uh, and how far they can get around in, in the city. Um, finally, and this is an important one for the project I'm going to be talking about, um, that the needs of children can act as a unifying theme for the pr promotion of progressive ideas and ambitious actions. So we found as we were developing this project that where um, there'd been trouble uh, dealing with issues, um, say let's talk about air quality for example, uh, where the carbon emissions lobby and where the climate change lobby did not have such an impact, if you could close the street to traffic, improve that air quality and see children out there spending time with their uh, relatives and enjoying the space, that was gained more traction and could really kind of connect all of these difficult, very abstract uh, problems for cities and really bring them home. Um, and it also encouraged people to work across different departments uh, in the city to, to make change happen. One of the things that we uh, were talking about to make uh, change happen was uh, inviting actors to be opportunistic and strategic to improve existing and new urban environments. And we talked about how big change is possible by a series of small coordinated uh, interventions that can be scaled up and adapted to different contexts. 
Um, and I'm really happy to be here actually today to have been testing this project, uh, these concepts that it was advocating as part of Cities Alive on this project in India and to see what we learned from it because uh, we've been trying these things out now. So I'm going to be talking about um, ITCN, which is the acronym for Infants, Toddlers, Caregiver Neighbourhood, um, as a smart way to build neighbourhoods to thrive in, which is this project uh, in India. I really like this uh, quote from Bill Gates, which came up, which also, I think, gives a bit of the smart city feel, um, that the first five years have so much to do with the next, uh, how the next 80 uh, turn out. And what I'll be hoping to show throughout this presentation, I'll come back to these, is how we were opportunistic and strategic in our approach on the India project, how we generated globally inspired but locally applied uh, ideas, and how to translate a national level program to something that has a real impact for families at the neighborhood level. Um, so I'll be talking you through um, a little about uh, some context of so infants and toddlers uh, caregivers in India. Um, I'll talk about the Smart Cities mission and how that relates to uh, ITCs and the ITC neighbourhood. I'll be saying ITCs as infants, toddlers and caregivers, just so you know. A bit of a mouthful. Um, I'll talk to you about the framework, so what we actually did, and then I'll talk a little bit about what, uh, what we've learned through that process. So infants, toddlers and caregivers in India. So um, India's population is about 18% of the world total, and it's one of the youngest countries in the world, which really kind of underpins the importance of doing something for children's futures in this context. In addition to that, um, children of uh, not five years uh, make up about 29% of the population in India. Um, so it's a huge proportion of the population that we could potentially um, impact through this project. Um, much of the population is going to be living in cities. And as the uh, pressures of urbanization continue, it's really important that we think about how we can enhance those cities and enhance the experience of those young children um, in, uh, in India. Um, and when we think about uh, how children are taken into account in the public realm, the public realm is something that is uh, really designed by adults. Um, and we forget what it's like to be a kid, and we forget to take kids into account um, when we're designing the public realm. Um, they tend to be the, the group that's out most in the city, spending most time in public space, but design for them is the least deliberate. Um, so... Uh, we can think about this idea of uh, planning for infants, toddlers, and caregivers as a way to empower and give some um, influence back. Um, um, I talked about uh, the initiative Urban 95. That asked the question, if you were uh, to experience the city from the height of 95 centimetres, which is the height of a healthy three-year-old, what would you change? Um, and 95 centimetres in India, um, the view actually of the city street, it's mostly uh, vehicles, mostly the exhaust. You're about the height of a car bumper, which um, is a very different experience for, um, for young kids than it is for adults. Um, that seems to be something that's obvious, but actually is quite surprising to see when you sort of crouch in these different spaces or you consider it from that perspective, how different and how overwhelming uh, the experience can be. Um, the challenges that we're facing uh, in Indian cities here, here are some of the um, challenges that have been encountered uh, that we try to address as part of this project. Um, uh, we try to sort of underline that actually the damage that's been done in cities and the challenges that have been uh, created are all very possible to undo. Um, in India, those challenges that we were uh, coming up across was the overwhelming car centricity um, and the pollution, uh, so real car dominance and the influence that, that has as a physical barrier, but also in terms of air quality, noise, um, and your ability to move around, whether or not you're able to um, get about uh, outside of a car and not be dependent on, um, uh, on the car uh, to move around. Um, Obstacles, uneven surfaces, difficulty without sidewalks, uh, moving around the city. Uh, the security and threat of personal crimes, so how safe you feel and how safe you actually are as you move in the city, also has an influence on uh, your experience um, at that age and also for the parent. 
uh, poor access to public facilities, so all the types of services that you need um, uh, to be accessing regularly uh, in those important first years, like healthcare services, like uh, even the public bathrooms, uh, places to eat, places to sit. A problem with uh, beautification instead of uh, play, so things that look aesthetically good to adults rather than something that is fundamentally, valu uh, fundamentally valuable for children. Uh, and a lack of maintenance, so once places have been put in place, they're not well maintained, they can fall into disrepair and that can cause problems uh, later down the line. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what children do need rather than what they don't need. Um, so children need response and focus from their caregiver. Um, and in, uh, the physical safety of women uh, goes hand in hand with the physical safety of children as well. Um, if uh, in India, um, caregivers are often female, so how safe you feel as a woman uh, in public space, how stressed or anxious you feel um, will influence your ability to provide that nurturing care for your child. Um, and uh, young kids take their cues from the expression of their caregiver. They're constantly reading their faces. So uh, any kind of stresses uh, that happen um, in the public realm also influence the de development of the, of the kid. So to be able to provide um, a good response, um, responsive attitude from the, from the caregiver, we also need to design for their own uh, health and safety in the public realm. Um, children need a repetition of supportive behaviour every day. So it's not only food and um, cleanliness that keeps them healthy. Um, the difference between uh, surviving and thriving is actually um, between the, not only the caregiver but also the built environment. So um, how, um, how you're fed, your daily hygiene, but the quality of the air you breathe, um, the water that you drink, who you play with, who you interact with are all uh, very uh, important points. Um, so responsive, playful, really meaningful interactions, storytelling with your caregiver um, are very important. And they are also impacted by your surroundings um, uh, as well as uh, by your family. Children need quality time outdoors on a regular basis. So um, the physical environment has been called the third teacher of children. Um, as well as the, and the parents are the first. So this is, again, um, your ability to sort of play, uh, explore your surroundings, um, be stimulated and not overwhelmed uh, is really depending uh, on, those, on those opportunities. Interesting things to see, interesting things to touch, um, all influence the way you develop. Uh, particularly... Uh, Nature is really important for, uh, for children to thrive. Um, exposure to nature has been shown to be really um, uh, positive for, for health and well-being um, and to also reduce the stress uh, that we feel as adults. Um, so in terms of like learning about natural materials, uh, the complexity of nature is a really fundamental thing for kids as well. Uh, importantly, I'll come back to this point that creating cities for children uh, can create quality of life for everybody. So... Um, uh, a, th a city that's thriving for children should also be thriving for uh, all other city dwellers. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the 100 Smart Cities mission. This is just an introduction to ITCs. So uh, the reason why we were talking about it in the Indian context. Hmm. So the 100 Smart Cities mission... Um, was a national uh, mission from the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. Um, involved um, cities competing uh, for funding, applying for funding, where they would be implementing um, pan-city and area development projects. Um, they had the uh, uh, objectives to uh, look at sustainability, inclusion, health and safety. And what that meant for most cities in India was that they wanted to upgrade basic infrastructure. Um, the idea is to drive economic growth and improve quality of life, and they wanted to do that by enabling this local development and also harnessing the potential of technology. And what we tried to show through this project was that actually investing in uh, infants, toddlers, and caregivers, because of all the reasons I've mentioned before, goes really well hand in hand um, in terms of uh, supporting economic growth. Um, and that actually it was a really good investment in the future if you were going to invest in this first five years of life. And what this is trying to show is this different smart city features along the bottom and how that can fit 
um, how those uh, resonate with the values I've just been talking about. Um, the uh, daily mobility needs of uh, ITCs are really different to uh, other urban dwellers, so which we've been talking a little about a little bit this afternoon. Um, so, uh, when you're moving across the city, uh, the difference between a kind of uh, lone person journey um, and a, a, a caregiver, a child journey is very different, looks very different. Um, and so, actually, if you only think about economic growth for a certain number of the population, um, it's not going to match up. And if this is what influences uh, decision making, these kind of peak commutes for efficiency, it's not going to be a true representation of the experiences that happen uh, in the city. So you can see here that the, uh, the middle one is um, moving between caring, homemaking, and employment. And, and the further one is uh, uh, multiple caregivers all interacting, the different places that you spend time in in the city, um, the destinations that you have to visit and how you interact uh, is far more complicated and far more challenging than urban decision making takes into account. Um, we talk about neighbourhoods because it's a really important uh, scale um, uh, for children to grow up. So how well your neighbourhood is planned, uh, the journey that you're making, whether or not you have to go across the city for those different destinations in, in the last slide, or whether you're able to do it within your neighbourhood um, is really important. So um, the types of services that you can uh, access within that range, uh, close by, uh, is super important. So, um, for example, if you have uh, healthcare available in your neighbourhood or the school available in your neighbourhood, or if you have to travel across the city, um, if you then have to travel across uh, another part of the city for work, um, that can really be restrictive for the uh, quality of the interactions um, um, that are able to happen. We talk about an uh, ITC neighbourhood as something that um, produces a safe, vibrant public realm um, with neighbours. Um, you can uh, include trusted providers and wider community services. So there's a mixture of like the neighbourhood scale, um, good routes, good journeys uh, within the street, parks and open spaces, um, different utilities, different public services, all being part of this multifunctional neighbourhood scale. Um, and the destinations being sort of ev evenly spread, really walkable to encourage uh, people to spend more time out in the public realm and to really facilitate the move of family life from inside the home to in, uh, outside in the neighbourhood. So we thought it was part of this 100 Smart Cities mission that actually the, um, the idea of this neighbourhood, the ICT neighbourhood, was a, a really good way to, to link into these different objectives of the Smart City features. Um, as a unifying lens, as a unifying theme for sustainable, healthy, safe and inclusive uh, improvements. Um, and to see uh, the ITCN as like an anchor for all smart cities, um, to make sure that the developments that come out as part of these pan-city and area-based uh, developments to be more meaningful for families and to see, ask the question, who's going to benefit from these smart city improvements and to try and enhance the impact that you can have for families, particularly because it's such a young population there. Um, importantly, this top uh, uh, graphic is trying to show that um, by uh, influencing the kind of um, area development, you can have a multiplier effect on your neighbourhood. So it's something that can be replicated and scaled across different neighbourhoods at a time to create a wider benefit for more communities. And I'll talk a little bit um, more now about the framework itself and what we did. So actually the, the 100 Smart Cities mission and the request um, from the ministry to produce these guidelines was a really rare opportunity um, to transform this kind of national scale influence into family uh, impact on family life. Um, we were producing quite a comprehensive package uh, which has just been launched, so you can now download this online and um, check it out afterwards. Um, we were developing this to support the health and well-being of infants, toddlers and caregivers. Um, the framework uh, includes a sort of conceptual framework, principles that all of the 100 smart cities should uh, uh, follow, um, and to guide these kind of uh, pan-city and area-based developments. Uh, it included um, design guidelines for new, new developments, a policy workbook for how it can be integrated into the policy uh, environment, evaluation monitoring to find out how well those things are working, um, and best practices for inspiration. 
So the idea with this is that it provides a clear and common objectives um, uh, that can guide through uh, the 100 smart cities and that can give an indicator of how well those cities are performing in terms of impacts for families. Um, it's also designed to equip city managers with the language and the tools to be able to do this, improve uh, experiences for families every day. Um, so knowing not only why it's important, but what can, they do, what can they do and how can they relate it to their own role and make sound decisions. Um, so this is uh, what the guide sort of looks like. We were trying to deal with uh, help uh, different types of decision makers. So from the sort of central decision makers, top level, um, to uh, heads of department and technical teams, all the way down these different layers. Um, so the framework, the conceptual element might help with the making the case, um, the policy uh, work but sets the environment that then enables the design guidelines, um, and it also gives some ideas on what practically at a smaller scale can you actually, can you actually do. Uh, the people were involved, um, so the smart city uh, mission was, were the people asking for it. Uh, Bernard Van Leer Foundation were the ones leading that as part of the Urban 95 initiative. Um, we worked with local partners, uh, BDP, uh, who were uh, executing quite a, a lot of the, of the work. And then we drew upon some sort of global expertise and an expert review panel um, across uh, Bernard Van Leer's network. Um, so there's a whole load of kind of knowledge that had been building around this Urban 95 initiative that was then brought into um, the, the project. Um, so this kind of global expertise that's been building over time, we had the opportunity to really build that together and see what was happening with it and try and test it out, which is, for me, very exciting. Um, the framework itself sets a vision, uh, sets the vision and objectives um, for the 100 smart cities. So here we've got... Um, uh, a series of how many? Five uh, different objectives. Um, so although uh, the way that they are implemented will differ for all the uh, different contexts in India, there are some fundamental principles across all of them that should be uh, followed and respected. Um, so those include uh, playful, green, safe, accessible and inclusive um, uh, neighbourhoods. Um, and the idea with this is that you... Uh, the objectives have like corresponding design guidelines that then explain how do you achieve a playful neighbourhood, how do you achieve an inclusive neighbourhood, and they also link through to the evaluation framework. So you have this kind of stage process. Um, the idea is that these would work in like a dynamic interplay and be uh, implemented in an integrated way. So you don't pick and choose how they work. You might be able to prioritise uh, some to be able to get started on your project, but they should all be complementary and working well together. And you, I won't go into all of the details on this, but you can see more in the uh, guidelines themselves. The best practice case studies provide some inspiration. So we were looking at uh, examples from India um, and also from across the globe um, and assessing them in terms of their safety, the greenery, the playfulness, the inclusivity, um, uh, to provide some inspiration about what can be done and what can be learnt, how to achieve those objectives. The design guidelines um, define an approach for that uh, and the way they're divided is into this sort of neighbourhood streets parks and open spaces, public services and utilities. So we're trying to get all the different uh, angles that can contribute to the experience at the neighbourhood level. Um, and it also uh, illuminates the interrelationships between physical components and tries to deal with um, some of the trade-offs that happen in decision making. Uh, it's uh, pushing for quality uh, while optimising the benefits for families. So this is where the question comes up about who, who is really benefiting and how can you enhance the benefit of your infrastructure improvements. So um, in the example here... Um, we've got uh, a graphic that shows the value um, to the development of infants, toddlers uh, and caregivers and how many are reached. Um, and we, what we were trying to get across is that you know, if you can put uh, 100 benches in that are just benches, and that would probably benefit more families, but the value to those families would be far greater if you put in 30 that were very well shaded, uh, well lit, that were well placed, that had some... Um, interactive elements around them. So you can create a higher quality intervention that can actually go further with your infrastructure improvements um, if you're more thoughtful about it. 
Um, I talked about uh, taking through, uh, taking decision makers um, through some of these processes, so knowing what to do. And this is just really trying to acknowledge that on a day-to-day -day basis for planning and design, you have some really tough decisions to make and you have a lot of conflicts to resolve and address. Um, so by setting out what the design challenges is, how to resolve these different viewpoints, all of the different challenges, all of the different asks from stakeholders that you need to deal with, um, helping them to prioritize and find uh, different entry points uh, to start a conversation and to resolve those uh, uh, conversations can start to help to prioritize those spatial, um, spatial needs and what can actually happen. So it's equipping them with the kind of insights and rationale to take things forward. Um, and that can also help to um, build some synergies and coalitions in the process um, to continue to uh, yeah, show who's benefiting um, and how the recommendations that they're making really comes back to family impacts. Um, it's also providing options for applications. I'm going to talk you through an example um, of some of the conversations that we've had as part of this uh, design guideline development. Mm. And some of the, um, yeah, some of the challenges of this kind of globally inspired but locally applied uh, interaction. So uh, one of the things that we advocate for uh, playable spaces um, is a connection to nature. Um, really making use of natural materials um, which are irregular, which have far more uh, value for children and for caregivers. But when we started to have this conversation, we came across a, ca a challenge, is that in India um, there's quite a lot of stray dogs around. Um, and so the conversation went, it was just like, okay, well, we've got these stray dogs, uh, there's going to be sand around, there's going to be all these natural materials, that's going to create a conflict and a problem. So does that mean that we can have like nothing natural at all in the in the space? Um, and actually, what we were saying, uh, the kind of um, uh, typical or reactive response might be that okay, get rid of everything natural, maybe put in a fence to prevent the stray dogs from interacting from this play space to protect the kids, um, make them safer. And what we tried to explore was that if you're actually going to put in a fence, does that mean that you can keep the natural materials because um, you've actually already got this other uh, element in place? And if you're going to have a fence, could you do something more interesting with it? So could you make it climbable? Can you build it out of natural materials? Could it contribute to biodiversity or maybe spaces to interact with? Or could it include some interesting uh, elements like music or sound, for example? So... Um, this was only part of the conversation that we were having and the, the way the design guidelines developed um, will, will be very different for the different cities. But it's just an example of how um, you, can, you have to go through this capacity building uh, and kind of design negotiation on every project to really deal with the local challenges uh, in a way that can still benefit children. And these are the types of compromises and uh, challenges that we're addressing all the time. Um, so this is another way that it provided uh, options uh, for applications. So actually, in the design guidelines, they have different street layouts to try and deal with uh, different scenarios, to try and deal with different types of situations, and examples of how that can be done. Um, I mentioned the policy workbook. Uh, so this is like really trying to embed it in the policy framework and remove any kind of uh, policy hurdles that would stop any of that from happening. So if you were to have a policy that said that you can't have natural materials or you have to have a fence, for example, that would be problematic, which may well be the case. <laughs> it's not a simple kind of uh, negotiation. Um, uh, this also provides the, a basis for the evaluation framework. So we took uh, elements of the existing guidelines, so um, they're all acronyms, but down the left is all the existing guidelines, try to look at the existing processes and strategies and integrate this idea into all of those existing processes. So it wasn't like a new system that had to be taken into, into account or a new process. Um, and what we were asking was, how do the existing guidelines uh, meet those uh, principles of the ITC neighbourhood? Um, what stakeholders need to be involved in the process? Which ones are already involved in the process? Are there any kind of roadblocks or challenges that we need to be aware of and try to overcome? Um, and how, do you, uh, how can the guidelines overcome those uh, with live examples? Uh, we also developed an evaluation and monitoring framework. Uh, so uh, this was, again, based on uh, indicators that were 
uh, already in the existing guidelines and also some new ones. Uh, we looked at uh, yeah, sort of indicators for each of the objectives. And then we looked at something that was called surface level benchmarks, which were already um, uh, existing in India. And we decided, OK, what would mean it was a surviving situation? Uh, then we had a middle one, which was striving situation. Uh, and then how could you move that into thriving? So e for each of the objectives, we had these different level benchmarks that we could measure performance uh, across. Um, and we also developed the idea of a, a dashboard to be able to monitor how well uh, cities and developments were working against that um, over time. So here are some of the indicators, just an example of from the safety side of things. Um, so I'll just take the top one, so um, whether there are uh, cycle routes in the neighborhood um, and any major bordering roads. So the level, uh, the extent to which that uh, indicator is being met in the neighborhood would indicate whether that is uh, performing in a surviving, striving or thriving situation. Um, yeah, the indicators measure the spatial components, and so uh, they actually lead into um, infants, toddlers, and caregivers' well-being, um, and kind of provide this uh, overarching, uh, holistic view of how well uh, that's performing. Um, the last thing that it was is demonstrating how the uh, data fit into the transformation process of the neighborhood. So uh, this data gathering we were advocating being done at the neighborhood level, which can be quite a challenge. Um, often uh, data is not really gathered at, at that level. Um, but we were trying to um, create this multiplier effect and join all the elements together. And if you can uh, have a consistent set of indicators, I think there were 65 in the framework, then you should be able to make a comparison between different neighborhoods, but also across different cities in India to see how well those are performing. So having this kind of common set of, um, let's call them KPIs, um, for each city to uh, measure themselves against uh, also helps you to share those ideas and have some comparability between situations to help with this kind of learning and improvements in the transformation of the neighborhood. Um, importantly, uh, this framework is guidance, and we know that actually it's only going to work if it actually happens. Um, so one of the things that we tried to uh, advocate was this, with this idea of the dashboard is that it would be embedded into practices and that actually through the dashboard you could measure how well you're doing it, what the projects are, um, how well they're performing, how well they're meeting the objectives, um, and that the guidelines, ideally uh, the framework would be reviewed and developed over time to incorporate this learning um, in a cyclical process. Things that we learnt from the process. Let's bear in mind this is one of the first times we've done something of this scale. Um, I'll come back to these ideas I was talking about. So being opportunistic and strategic, globally inspired and locally applied ideas, and translating national level programmes into the neighbourhood impact. So being opportunistic. So this was a piece of work that we knew were gonna, was going to take at least six months. And the timescales for the project that we were given by the ministry were six weeks. Um, so we wanted to jump on that opportunity uh, to be able to do something to improve uh, the situation and, and put these guidelines in place uh, for young children and their caregivers. Um, but we also need to do it in a strategic way. So what it meant is that the, the comprehensive guidance that we uh, built up uh, was, was uh, designed to have this kind of replicable, replicable and scalable quality. So you could have these neighborhoods uh, generating um, and also recognize the need for different uh, responsibilities to, have, uh, to be taken from different departments. So by uh, having these different levels of the decision maker, the technical uh, guidance, the kind of managers in between, we're trying to uh, provide an opportunity for all levels of influence uh, to take into account. So they can see how it connects to their role and how they can all contribute to the framework together. Um, globally inspired and locally applied ideas. So because of this project being pushed so quickly, um, actually one of the real successes of the project was being able to um, pull together all this global uh, network of knowledge. Um, 
Um, so it involves a lot of capacity building, actually, when you're looking at child development, bringing that together with uh, the needs of young children in particular, and also relating that to good uh, local design. Um, it's always a process of learning on a, on a project. Um, so the opportunity to be able to sort of gather that expertise um, from the Urban 95 network uh, from around the globe and to, make, uh, to have the involvement of the expert review panel really help to sort of review and feedback and improve in a very quick way that are enable to us, us to deliver. We were looking at, uh, yeah, the national level program was having a neighborhood level impact. And I think that very uh, idea that we're using neighborhood level interventions would hopefully improve that. Um, but this is, yeah, this is quite a, a challenge to look at the neighborhood level, as I said, because it's not a typical uh, scale that development is done at. So this is quite a new uh, idea. Um, but we think it's really important to be able to ensure that the uh, this kind of local evaluation and local impact for cities in the future. Um, so I'm going to finish by just saying that we, yeah, we don't have all the answers for the um, uh, 100 smart cities. What we've done is we've tried to put together this framework to set a good tone, and hopefully there'll be opportunities to continue that learning uh, and continue the way that the guidelines are developing over time um, and to see how the potential for learning can, can continue. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Reflections? Okay. Thank you, Hannah. This was amazing. Um, I would like to hear, uh, or maybe hear from you, uh, how you have imagined that there is a kind of continued um, uh, engagement with the Whatever with the city or the implementers, because yeah. I assume that they, uh, though they have the guideline, they still need handholding yes. once they have to start implementing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's so it's really important with any guidance like this that it's not just uh, given and then left, um, and actually that you don't expect people to go through it and read it themselves and know what it means. Um, the interpretation of the guidance and the way it translates into practice is is fundamental. Um, so we don't know for sure what the next steps would be. Uh, there is an intention to do some capacity building with the people who will be implementing it in the different cities. So there should be uh, like a training process um, to then see uh, not just um, help people to know, to know how to use it and how to implement it, but also to continue learning about whether it works or not and hopefully continue to improve it. So that's, that's an intention, um, but we don't know yet how that's going to continue. Any questions from the room? Otherwise, I'm sure it's all right. Thanks, Anna. Um, one question, kind of from the beginning. Um, what, who integrated the childhood perspective into the smart city conversation? Like, how, how did that come about? How did it come up? Um, I'm not sure I know exactly how it came up. There was an interest um, from the decision-making level about what it could be. Um, and there was a series of different guidelines that were being produced. So uh, it, was, it was one of, I think, maybe four or five different uh, guidelines that could be produced for the, the 100 smart cities. Um, Rushta, who's the Bernard Van Leer um, representative in India, um, did some great work sort of raising the awareness and the agenda for uh, Urban 95 in that context. And I, I, my impression is that it happened quite quickly. But I don't know what it was that made them change their mind. If you like, that'd be interesting to find out. Um, because I'm, I'm curious, because India, of course, is also a big technology um, producer and um, exporter also in some ways. And, yeah. and were there any challenges that you had in that regard, like that the, the expectation for the smart city was actually more technology driven? And yeah. Maybe because all, all most of everything that you have shown us is, of course, technology driven that it, it has to be done with knowledge but then it's yeah. not really technology driven not digital. The, yeah, it's, it's, there's not much silicon in there yeah yeah um yeah so again I'll, I'll i'll reflect on this from my the conversations i've had and experiences on the on the project um so actually uh 
the way I understand it was that it was a concern that people might be overly focused on technology because it's called smart city. But each of the cities who were um, a, uh, applying for funding could decide what they thought a smart city meant and actually um, on what they needed to provide this quality of life and sustainability um, and healthy cities. And across the board, it was relating to basic infrastructure more so than technological um, interventions. So they had the choice to relate uh, really to what their own objectives for the city were, and that's what came out most. And just to clarify for myself also, but, so the 100 cities are 100 Indian cities? Yes. Yes, okay. yes. because they have more than 100. 100 cities obviously. across, yes. yeah, across uh, India, yeah. Do you know how many cities exist in India? I don't. Oh, no. No. Okay, just, just, like, uh, just I'm <laughs> curious like, what, uh, what that target yeah, is. what proportion yeah. it would be. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm afraid not. Well, yep. That's fine. <laughs> I'm sure you have a question too, Alexis. As somebody uh, clearly very interested in design guidelines, um, I'm just really curious because after years of thinking about design guidelines, um, I really felt compelled that the whole system of delivery had to be hacked. Um, that, you know, four point framework with a kind of um, policy guideline evaluation strategic thing, it's, it, it's a little bit, um, you know, um, not just bureaucratic, but it's not inviting. Mm. And it's very linear, and a lot of these processes aren't linear. Um, and we've really tried to reflect on the actual format, the object itself, to invite new types of participation because this linear format is just, um, again, very alienating. Yeah. You have to, you know, you're, you're presented with four policy books, the yeah. images that are presented to you are typically stock photographs, um, it says it's relevant, and yet the, the topics are very generic and abstract for most people. Like, what does safety mean? It means yeah. very different things. And I'd be very curious, after you've now achieved this content, some of the thinking that you have to actually reinvent the design or framework to actually get this in the hands of people. Yes. Yeah, I think that's a really, um, really valid point. Um, yeah, the extent to which this guidance is used, um, yeah, is crucial. As I said, like it's only going to be done uh, if people can make use of it and actually put it into practice. It's not good enough that it's uh, only a framework. Um, yeah, and I, I, I think you're right also that some of this information can be overwhelming and can be abstract. So there were ways that we tried to deal with that through the information that we included. And um, I didn't have time to go through it today, but the, the guidelines do get um, pretty specific um, in terms of what safety means and how you measure it. Um, but there's also a danger that you can be too specific or you can make too many assumptions and you also need to apply it to that local context. So the types of um, elements we included in, in this sort of decision-making process were designed to prompt uh, people to think about uh, what their questions are, what their situations are and how they can apply it. And I, my opinion is that the uh, capacity building that goes alongside that is the most important uh, most important thing. Um, so actually the, the training that's involved, sitting with the designers, being able to um, uh, take an actual design problem and apply these principles to it and work through it together in a collaborative way would be far, far more valuable. Um, I did a review of guidance for um, Urban 95 to see how well some of that guidance was uh, working and some of the challenges that came up. Um, and what came back from that review was that it was really important to have a common vision and a common set of objectives to work from so that you can measure performance against it. And I think that's what this guidance does well. Um, the other feedback that came back was that the... Um, yeah, it's people <laughs> that make the difference and the skills of those people um, and how able they feel to champion an idea, how well they think it uh, relates to their role. And I'd like to see uh, this be kind of coupled with some more interactive, uh, uh, more engaging, um, maybe workshops or processes that can really integrate it into the, into the uh, design. Um, so I think actually working on guidance that is more interactive, that is more, uh, that is simpler, and more usable, is a really uh, valuable, uh, really valuable point. Actually, my other reflection would be that, um, 
Yeah, I know that uh, NACTO, who've been doing the Global Street Design Guide, uh, we've talked a lot about how comprehensive guidance should be, um, what, what decision makers or managers might ask for is like, you know, uh, a book that tells them everything, uh, and it's all in one place, and then you have all of the answers. Um, you know, they're kind of, if you tell us what to do, we'll just get on and do it. Um, and that think, that thoughtful interpre interpretation that's so important is not, it requires a lot of energy and a lot of effort. Independent thinking is not always desirable. So I think actually the way you approach it and you deal with the particular challenges of the people you're working with is, is also really important. Um, I had a good conversation with NACTO about um, the guidance needing to be comprehensive enough uh, that you can sort of provide answers to kind of go to um, and technical enough that you get through some of these hurdles that might come up in, um, in implementation. So, you know, just, just dealing with the objectives isn't enough and that specificity is, is really important because it's, it's all very well saying that you need to have an inclusive neighbourhood. If the design that they come up with that's inclusive then meets a policy hurdle later down the line, then you're going to fall over in the process. So it's always a balance between, um, yeah, the level of detail that you include. Um, but I wouldn't... Yeah, I don't know how this is going to develop in the future, but I do think it's valuable to couple it with a, a different uh, set of uh, guidance styles, if you like. Other questions? I'm going to put you on the spot as well. Me? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, uh, thank you. Uh, I was wondering about this hundred cities because hundred is a big number, actually. Yes. Uh, and deal with and do this project is, I believe, it's a huge work. But I was wondering about the scales and the cities because probably they are not like have the same population or same industry or same economic level. So yeah. how did it work? Uh, with these guidelines and this totally different hundred yeah. uh, cities, did you what did you learn about it? Yeah, yeah. Again, so this was the balance between you know, doing something that's uh, I was going to say global enough, but nationally enough that each of those cities can can uh, have this kind of common objective. But the way that it's interpreted at the local level is really going to change. So, of course, I mean, the, the difference in neighbourhoods across a city is totally different and diverse, let alone the difference in cities across, um, across the country. Um, so we were trying to give uh, suggestions of indicators um, that could be sort of hooked onto, but I think there is a little bit of room for interpretation as well. I actually don't know the answer for how well it's going to be interpreted yet. That's still to be seen, but I think we're going to be keeping a close eye on that, um, how it develops in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe you can elaborate a little yeah. bit more about the next steps. So, how what is going to happen, really? Yes, I don't. I, I don't. Honestly, I don't know the answer. <laughs> uh, um, I know there's a discussion going on about if there is potential for capacity building, um, and for example, the use of the dashboards. They were kind of um, options or opportunities that we um, that we put into place um, for this this project. Um, for the foundation and the work that I'm doing, my next steps are going to be to reflect on these experience, how quickly um, how quickly this process came up, um, you know, pulling together this information, this framework, how well that worked or not. I'd like to bring those lessons into other pieces of guidance. Um, and I think particularly, I, I would like to look into some of the um, common challenges that come up uh, in terms of design guidelines. Um, so I gave the example of like fences and play spaces and natural materials before. I'd also quite like to take a look at, um, uh, we were having a discussion about parking and sidewalks. I think that would be a really valuable one to look at. Uh, surveillance, um, you know, trying to uh, look at more, um, I don't want to say innovative, but more interesting ways to deal with common challenges that come up, management and maintenance perhaps, that can still have a value for children. Um, and some of those lessons are going to be coming out in different Urban 95 uh, guidelines. So we're working at the moment on developing the next version of the starter kit, um, uh, which gives these ideas for action. 
And we're also working on an implementation framework to kind of get to the how part, um, and not just how in terms of spatial interventions that can be done, but also how do you start to work with people? How do you build a team? How do you build that awareness? Um, how do you make sure that you can translate a brief into design practice? We're trying to mm -hmm. give some uh, tangibility to those as well. Yeah. Also, one more additional question. Yeah. Um, do you know details of how do you uh, get the local knowledge? Because India is actually famous with the frugal innovation. I mean, especially this kind of examples like what type of fence you should use to separate between stray dogs and uh, the, the park or yeah. sand park, let's say. Uh, actually, India is quite innovative in this sense itself. So is there a channel that you are learning from India? Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. So the, we had local partners on the ground who were BDP, um, and they would do the majority of the work. Uh, and it was a case of kind of taking this, um, the kind of child development Urban 95 knowledge that we had, and then uh, working very closely with them to understand what that meant at the local level. So this was the example that I gave was one of the conversations came up, but it wasn't necessarily how it was resolved. Um, and it was also part of my learning, because obviously I didn't know the Indian context before. Um, so, you know, what works in different um, uh, yeah different uh, cultural social um, political situations is yeah it was really important so yeah I think I would probably underline the importance of doing that local uh, knowledge I don't think we should be assuming we know best uh, yeah Hey, <laughs> I think you had uh, spent some time in the city. Uh, you came earlier, I yes, think, to I Istanbul. Did. Do you yeah. have some specific observations, including, I mean, within the Istanbul 95 project to the city, I mean, for Istanbul, let's say? Yeah, uh, reflections on the experience here. Um, yeah, so uh, the things that, uh, off the top of my head, that really s struck me here, are um, in terms of challenges, uh, topography in the city. So I was uh, watching a lot uh, people pushing strollers up and down hills. Uh, we've talked a lot about sidewalks, uh, and we had a conversation about uh, useless sidewalks or how effective the sidewalks are with kind of parking. Um, so those, I mean, and those things are. Um, it's, it seems to be the type of thing that people think is like okay, obvious or. Um, I don't know, kind of straightforward to resolve, but the, the sidewalks are all over the city in every single street and they impact everybody's journey, so they're important to get right. On the positive side of things, I have been really, um, I think there's a really good energy in Istanbul. Um, I think the uh, openness to interaction has a lot of potential. There's a lot of really great street life going on, um, interaction between people that ha seems to happen very naturally. So I think actually if you, can, if you can sort of enable that by providing the setting for those things to happen, it could be, um, yeah, it could be really valuable. So, yeah, I feel good about Istanbul. <laughs> yeah. Um, I crossed with this project uh, like six months ago, but by mistake, like by chance, I guess, okay. uh, when I was doing my uh, research in India, Jaipur. It's one of the okay. smart cities also. Yeah. And uh, we uh, crossed with many um, city elements which uh, written smart cities, uh, the, this logo. Yeah. Uh, but they were, many of them were ruined, so we thought that it's a bit ironic that we, it, that's why it's actually took our. Uh, uh, mention it uh, and I talked with my professor about the project and she was really um, enthusiastic about the project and he was, she was um, about the smart cities yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. and uh, she was talking about how it can be and well, what's the potentials and, but uh, in that time it felt a bit um, technical like it's, mm. it, to me it felt in that way because it wasn't really adapted in that time, uh, probably for some cases. Yeah. Uh, but I also uh, crossed with this example that I thought maybe it could work in that sense. Um, in Nepal, uh, after earthquake, uh, people were supposed to build um, these uh, houses in a better con in better condition, but yeah, uh, people way. were not able to do it, so people were doing by themselves again, and uh, local governments were uh, like were no it, and people uh, they were adding some uh, guidelines into the cities, like 
it, it wasn't the proper way to do it, to build a house, but they were uh, showing some like tricks. So how yeah, can you uh, make, yeah, how, how, how can we make it more uh, stable if you're doing by yourself? Yeah. Maybe, uh, I thought these uh, fences and other green parts could, uh, could be added. In yeah. This, like, because it's also, ha yeah, like, it's also, yeah. That's all, I guess. Yeah, that's a nice, that's a really nice idea, actually, because if it, if those types of efforts are being made anywhere, but yeah. anyway by the community, why not uh, share some ideas? Yeah, uh, yeah. And that, which is kind super, of. Um, sorry for. No. Uh, they were also super. They, there was a potential to do many things, and with this, like, if they can really yeah, if together, they can bring they, their efforts together. Just, yeah. yeah, and if if this, I suppose this is also a good example of being opportunistic. Um, yeah, because if there's things that would go alongside that, so if as you're rebuilding uh, the home, you can also do something with the fences, as you said, or if you can do something with the roads and then provide something else uh, in a low cost kind of simple way, um, that it would actually build the, um, the movement and the benefit of those interactions. I think that's a nice example, actually. Could you share it with me yeah, afterwards? Sure. No, there's no Thank you. Nice. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Let's start from the back. Yeah. Which uh, countries are at the forefront of ITC consideration when uh, looking at town planning at the moment? Would it be like Scandinavia or? Ah, uh, it depends on which way you look at it. Um, I would say that there are. Yeah, it depends on how you look at it. So if I, I would uh, sort of interpret uh, a way to measure it as more broadly in terms of play and independent mobility. Scandinavia performs well in terms of independent mobility, so kids being able to spend time outdoors unaccompanied by adults. Um, but that's a very particular set of kind of contexts. And actually, um, we do a lot of study tours that tend to come to Amsterdam and Copenhagen. Um, to look at examples of how good child-friendly urban planning can be done. But for me, it's more interesting to look at actually what steps, not with a comparison between cities globally, um, but the steps that can be taken in any context. Um, so each um, Urban 95 has a series of different cities um, in South America, in Eastern Europe, uh, in uh, India, um, where there's very different efforts being made, but they're using the existing resources that they have and they're dealing with a different context. So, for example, um, there's some great work being done in uh, Bogota on children's priority zones where they're, cha they're using paint um, and very sort of low-cost interventions to uh, change the way that people see priorities for children in a certain space. Uh, here in Istanbul, there's some really great work being going on in terms of pop-up playgrounds and play spaces. Uh, I really liked your stroller audit that you were doing. I thought that was a really interesting idea. Um, in Tirana, they've got a child development officer that's working across different departments. Um, Tel Aviv, I'm working on some improving walk walking environments with tactical interventions. So it's difficult to say which one's doing, uh, doing like the best. I think actually um, we should look at the change that's being made in those cities and how they improve it um, because they can all learn a lot from, from each other. So it's like a politician's response. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you for the question. <laughs> um, any last questions? So I have one, I think, last question. You have a question. Okay. So, huh? Two last questions. So, last question. Oh, I don't know if it's not last questions, but I, I guess the, just trying to connect to what Alexis is saying, I, I guess the, since you're asked for, from the authorities to provide, provide mm. the guidebook, right, then I know Alexis has been working from the other end yeah. uh, a little bit. Uh, so, of, of course, you can't really merge those two. Well, maybe you can, I don't know. But uh, it's, there's two different ends of the spectrum of approaching change in the urban space. Um, so I was wondering if, like, I can't really imagine that you can give your guidebooks to the politicians and they will say, okay, great, that's a great recommendation, let's do it and vice versa. Mm. Um, but it could be interesting to find a middle way. Yeah. 
but yeah, you have given them to uh, oops, politicians, no? How could we work together, Alexis? <laughs> no, I mean, I think this is the real struggle. Like, is it, I, I think there is the middle way. It shouldn't be bottom up or top down. This is the whole idea of empowerment and participation in our democracies. Who's serving who, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the politicians are supposed to be serving their constituents, and the constituents are supposed to be serving their community, right? Yeah. I think this is the I say, framework, at least, that's being that's been presented in the 21st century or 20th century as far as citizenship. Like, what is the role of citizenship? And I, I think that's one of the things that maybe to take the question one step further it, and the question that people are asking in the sense I... I or maybe bring all these conversations together because I think do-it-yourself urbanism, tactical urbanism, it has a currency, but it also isn't the same of enduring proper intervention. Yeah. That you really do need this top-down type of city building because that's what makes it coherent. You can't just constantly, you know, do something pop-up, you know, and the pop-up economy actually has a lot of vulnerabilities yeah. um, this way. And, and I do think one of the things that I found very disheartening being from a developing con economy is that a lot of the guidance is coming from a very particular voice of a very particular idea of the city and it's and it's a very impersonal voice um, and it's a very abstracted voice and I don't know how much that resonates in the sense of citizenship because the whole when you look at kind of democracy it's about making intimate relationships and interpersonal relationships and that includes mayorships or local mayorships and and actually when there's a lot of trust capital between the mayors and the citizens you get a lot of really cool stuff done but when it's not there you don't and i think and i think i'm sure your guideline addresses trust capital but i somehow feel like we have to totally reinvent or innovate the actual thing to include somehow these diverse voices without being a kind of mashup of um, pop-ups or even just stock photographs or stock ideas yeah. or stock, I mean, I feel like we're borrowing like, and cities, the more and more that I look at, I was even very heartbroken recently going to Copenhagen feeling this, it's kind of like, you know, everything looks the same after a while. And, and these cities that have such a unique culture and history and subtlety and nuance, even amongst themselves, yeah. and diversity is being lost in, I believe, some of the ways that we write guidance, you know, and best practice, because there is this universal idea of what some of these things are, and, and I, I do question it a lot in my own thinking. So yeah. I'd be curious what you think about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, I, think, I, mean, I think that... We, uh, at the kind of um, high levels of decision making, they would be shirking responsibility if they did rely on pop up and temporary spaces and tactical urbanism. I think they're really great efforts, but I think it's it's not enough for uh, policymakers not to be contributing to this debate in a in a strategic way, so that the benefits can be spread and so they can be. Yeah, I mean, I say replicated, but it would have to be. Uh, it doesn't mean the same intervention. It means that you can. Um, contribute to similar benefits or similar principles in, in a local way. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in how we can, um, how do we provide guidance that does actually get to that interpretation. Um, and I, I don't know uh, how to do that well yet. Um, uh, I think it's a really valid um, point that some of the, like, the global guidance um, becomes like diluted maybe, or you know, there's only certain ways that it can be apply to different contexts um, and how, I don't know, does that mean that we then produce more like local guidance? Um, my, my intuition tells me that um, it's more about, more about the approaches and processes and getting good teams together, not to produce more guidance, but actually just to work on live projects and see, and see what happened and to build a good team for those processes. Um, I don't think that you would find the benefits and the answers that we're looking for, and I think they're good things that you're looking for, I don't think you would find that from guidance uh, in this type of form. I think you'd find that in the interactions uh, that you have on a day-to-day -day decision making and day-to-day -day projects. So that's where I'd like to influence. Mm. Yep. 
Any more questions? No. Okay, well, one, one last question on my end uh, then. Uh, are there any uh, academic institutions that are being uh, pulled into this conversation of the 100 cities and the work that you're doing uh, in India? Yeah, I don't know actually. Uh, okay. I hope, yeah, I hope so. Uh, there was, we were working with, um, um, we were working with some people who I know had academic links. Uh, I didn't work any with any universities in particular, but um, I would hope so. I'll, uh, I'll ask the question um, to see if there's some learning. We, we would love done. to connect, basically. I think the, yeah. uh, like if, if there, and I guess it would be, uh, to, bar, uh, to use a lovely word, missed opportunity not to integrate some universities to this uh, process, yes. um, because then they can help also with the learnings, yes. especially from the implementation side. Yes. Definitely. Um, and so, uh, evaluating be, the impact would be really right. important. Yeah, yeah, so we would be also uh, very happy to be put in touch when you guys locate yeah. those. Thanks. Okay, so thank you so much. And uh, this was, uh, we will have actually, uh, let's make an announcement also. Uh, thank you, Hannah. And on um, Monday, Okay. Uh, on Tuesday, next week, actually, we have a few uh, events related to Istanbul 95 effort in Istanbul. On Tuesday um, at 4 o'clock, uh, we will be hosting and actually having, a, a, let's say, a small training session about playground and safety uh, from uh, the, the CEO of uh, Nordic Playground Institute, uh, Einar. Uh, he's a really amazing, uh, also very a passionate person about play and what it means uh, a dangerous uh, playground is there such a thing and what what it means to uh, to work with risk and what and he knows it from a very uh, kind of numbers and uh, hard data and uh, standards point of view so if you're interested um, in this uh, conversation please join us on Tuesday at four o'clock it will be here uh, and and we will have a, a event on <laughs> Wednesday at 5 p.m. Uh, Barry Zuckerman. Uh, I, I don't know the rest. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I know the rest. I just didn't know the time. But uh, I know the story. Uh, Barry is one of the uh, leading experts around the world, actually, uh, apparently on reading uh, books to children. So he he's, uh, comes from another point perspective, but uh, uh, he is here to work with Üsküdar University, but then we borrowed him. Uh, to also lecture at Studio X. And part of it is we are really hoping to uh, have uh, more designers who are interested in doing things, pop-up things in playgrounds, uh, and maybe actually do book readings in playgrounds. It really takes no effort. Um, Ege has been practicing this uh, at Studio X library for last two months now. Every Thursday we have a reading hour. So actually, um, I think those of us who are burning to do things in the public space, uh, we are trying to create the opportunities and also the learnings necessary to put that into practice. So that is on Wednesday at 5. Uh, so you are also welcome to join that. And please spread the word, even if you cannot come, uh, if you know people who would be interested in, in joining to those two events, we would be very happy uh, to host them. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me.